Coming up next on Living on the Edge. The question that he keeps asking them and asking us is, will you, and you can write this down, will you believe? Will you believe? Will you trust me? Will you believe who I say I am? Will you believe when I tell you who I am? Will you believe I'm coming back? Will you believe to the point of putting your faith in me and actually following me? Welcome to Living on the Edge. I'm Chip Ingram, and I want to ask you a question. Are you or someone you really care about going through a, a very difficult time? I mean, an earth-shattering cancer, a major operation, a car wreck, a, a divorce. You know, where do you go when life gets shattered? Regardless of your background, your age, your gender, we're all going to face things where our world gets rocked. And in our teaching today, we're going to talk about how Jesus enters into the life of impossible situations. If that's you, stay with me. I think God has a word for you. I'd like to have you think just for a minute of maybe the last time in your life you felt literally hopeless. Maybe it was a devastation of a relationship. Maybe it was a biopsy report. Maybe you just walked into a room and walked out without a job or lost your home. And I don't care who you are or where you've been. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't how, matter how wealthy. It doesn't matter how strong, how famous. At some point in your life and in mine and in people that we love, you find yourself in a situation where it's beyond what you got. And you can't fix it, and you can't change it. And you just are absolutely helpless and hopeless. We spent some time learning, so what is God really like in John? It's his authorized biography. And in chapter 1, we learned that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything that has come into being came into being through him. And that Jesus is the word. It became flesh and dwelt among us. And that the God of the universe came fully man, fully God, to explain the Father full of truth and grace. In chapter 2, we learned that he wanted to launch a movement, a movement of love. And so he started at a wedding and where there's joy and laughter and dancing and did sort of the unthinkable, you know. Six huge gallons, big 180 gallons really in these big six jars of wine and declared that God is about life and love. And, and then in the same chapter, he decided that he would clear the temple because cold religion with rules that were binding people and blinding them, he just, he addressed it that it was, there's no way that his father's house could become a place just for marketeering and profiteering. Chapter 3, he introduced this concept that it's not about anything external, but you need to be spiritually born. And so the most religious man that we can find, who is squeaky clean in his morals, came to Jesus by night named Nicodemus. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And then in chapter 4, if we really want to know what God is like, he just always has a heart for the marginalized, people that no one cares about. And so there's a woman with five husbands. She's living with a guy. She comes out in the middle of the day. And she comes out then because she's socially ostracized. And Jesus breaks every barrier of culture and gender, of racial prejudice, and he invites her to receive eternal life. And this person who knows very little and with absolute no background is the key to an entire city coming to know him personally as the disciples are scratching their heads and overcoming their prejudice. By the time we get to chapter 5, Jesus is now revealing this is what God is like. He's a life giver. He's a lover. He's someone who cares. He's someone that doesn't tolerate hypocrisy and using religion to make money. And then chapter 5 opens up, 
And you'll notice on the front of your notes, it's strange. There's a story, but it's one of the most unusual miracle stories in all the New Testament. We'll look at it in the middle. I mean, it is just strange. It's unusual. And I'll tell you why. And then after this miracle story, um, there's a conflict. And the conflict is actually intentional and strategic. Jesus actually picks a fight. He does some things habitually to get head-to-head with the religious leaders. After that, he does some teaching. And it's been veiled and don't tell anyone. There's a secret messiahship and he reveals it to this person, that person. But there's no more of that. He, he literally takes the gloves off and goes head to head with the religious leaders and speaks as directly and as clearly about who he is, his relationship with the Father, why he came, and what we all need to know. And then after that, there's a validation. He talks about witnesses that validate these outrageous claims that shock those people. And then finally, the question that he keeps asking them and asking us is, will you, and you can write this down, will you believe? Will you believe? Will you trust me? Will you believe who I say I am? Will you believe when I tell you who I am? Will you believe I'm coming back? Will you believe to the point of putting your faith in me and actually following me? And so that's where we're headed. What would Jesus say? Because you learn a lot about God and you learn a lot about people. And how they respond to people whose lives don't work, that are helpless and absolutely hopeless. Jesus purposely challenges the cultural status quo to reveal his person and his purpose in the world. Sometime later, chapter 5, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Jews. We don't know which feast, but it's probably not the Passover. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate Pool, which is in Aramaic called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to be, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there, he had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, now think of this. This is an unusual question. Do you want to get well? Duh. Do you want to get well? And just before we go on, I want you to visualize what it would be like to be an invalid for 38 years. Shriveled limbs, complete atrophy, spindly little legs, absolutely no thighs. He can't move. He can't even get himself into this pool of water. An emaciated person, completely dependent on other people, absolutely hopeless. And Jesus asks what seems to be sort of a silly question, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get in the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes ahead of me. There there was a a tradition and a legend that this pool, an angel would visit this pool, and when the waters would begin to bubble, people would go there and be healed. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, it's the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is the fellow who told you pick up your mat and walk? Now talk about strange. The man who was healed had no idea who it was for Jesus had slipped away in the crowd that was there. So he exercises no faith. Jesus doesn't even say who he is. He does one of these heels and runs. I mean, you don't see that a lot. And the the guy can't figure out what's going on. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who'd made him well. Now that is... Another strange thing, usually after Jesus heals people, the rare response is, stop sinning or something worse is going to happen. Here's what I want you to understand. The Holy Spirit has placed this live historical event in this chapter and this place, and it will set up teaching, and you will not understand completely what's going on here until we get to the very end. And so here's a couple observations I made. Um, It's a strange question. I mean, it is strange to ask, do you want to get well? 
There's no mention of his motive. You know, he's not filled with compassion. We don't hear anything about Jesus like other miracles. It does, he doesn't reveal his identity. There's no instrumental means. I mean, often he touches someone or he takes dirt and, and, uh, and makes mud and puts it on their eyes. All he does is just speak. He, he leaves immediately. That's odd. I don't know of any other miracle where he, he does a miracle and then just slips into the crowd. He purposely creates controversy. He does it on the Sabbath so that as soon as this happens, they're uptight about this guy walking around and carrying this mat. He does that, you'll find in a minute, absolutely on purpose. The man expresses no gratitude. It's not like, thank you, appreciate it. You know, it's been 38 years. I really didn't want to get well. I was going for a 40-year record. I mean, I mean, I mean think how strange this is. Can, can you imagine, I mean, your limbs would be shriveled. Immediately you're healed. You would have flesh. You would have strength. You would think like, thanks, or who are you, or what's going on? Nothing. Very, very odd. Jesus affirms the relationship between sin and negative consequences. The Bible's really clear that all sickness is not because of sin. In fact, in chapter 9, the disciples say of this young person who grew up and then is, his, is he blind because of his parents' sin or his sin? And Jesus said, no, there's not always a one-to-one correlation. It was neither of them. But it is true that some sickness, some illness, there is a relationship between sin and consequences. In fact, death ultimately is a result of sin. And apparently in this particular case, we don't know how long or how many years he lived before the 38 years, but apparently there was some sin going on that Jesus healed him. We also know in the Jewish mindset, this is all set up because Jesus wants to make a point. In the Jewish mindset, there was a concept that if a person, if there was any deformity or any sickness, they believed it was all a result of sin. In fact, that's why the disciples asked the question in John chapter 9. And then if someone was healed, they correlated that with their sins being forgiven. And so Jesus is literally doing a miracle in a strange, unique way because he wants to set the stage for a controversy so that he can reveal himself to the religious leaders as clearly and as powerfully and in a way that connects with their background and their belief system. You're watching Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. Chip will be back with the rest of his message in just a minute. If you're new to us, Living on the Edge is an international teaching and discipleship ministry dedicated to helping Christians really live like Christians. To view additional broadcasts, visit us at livingontheedge.tv. Now, let's join Chip for the rest of today's message. The conflict then is intentional and strategic. Notice, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. And if you want to put a little line under uh, doing those things, that's in a tense of the verb means he was habitually. So he was like healing on the Sabbath, and then the next Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, and then healing on the Sabbath. In other words, he's the signet ring, the mark of being a Jew in this day was circumcision of your children, you're a part of the covenant, and the Sabbath. It's absolutely holy. That's what makes us Jewish. And they had an external belief system that, I mean, think about this. Instead of asking, aren't you the guy that's been laying here for 38 years? Wow, this is amazing. You can walk. Who did it? How did it happen? I mean, doesn't it seem odd to you that they're more uptight about him walking on a holy day than they are about the miracle that happened? And see, what Jesus is pointing out to them is that they made the means the end, that they have such a rigid religious system, they've forgotten about mercy and grace and kindness and love, and all they can think of and all they can see is the rules. And so he's habitually doing this because he's, trying, he's poking at them. He's picking a fight. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he's even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Notice he says, my father is working. The Jews believe that when it says in Genesis, God rested, that somehow God wasn't doing anything anymore. In fact, he only intervened maybe to punish wicked people or to empower righteous people. And he doesn't doesn't say the father or our father. He says, my father. 
And they get the correlation and they realize, this is outrageous. You're making yourself out to be God. And then notice their response. Their response is, for this reason, they're trying all the harder to kill him. So now the stage is set. Jesus has uh, pushed very, very hard. And now the issue is, who are you really? What's going on here? Who do you think you are? You're claiming equality with God. And now what you're going to see is the most direct teaching. Shocking. If, if you could be in the room and watch Jesus teach and then watch these Pharisees, the hair would first go up on the back of their neck and then it would go straight up and then their red face and the veins would be bulging. This is blasphemous. This is the most ridiculous stuff. Who do you think you are? And what he's going to do is he's going to bring them to a crossroads like never before. Literally, the gloves come off. No innuendo, no inferences, no. He's going to say, this is who I am. And the direct teaching happens in two specific areas. Area number one, he's going to explain his relationship to the Father. I mean, you and the Father, we don't get it. You've hinted at these things. You've made yourself to be equal with God. The second thing he's going to do, he's going to explain his relationship to the world. The entire world. We pick it up in verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son does also. Notice he makes the point. The son is dependent. But he also makes this outrageous claim that he can see what the father is doing. And then he's making the outrageous claim that the same things the father is doing, he is doing. I mean, literally, these guys, the veins are starting to bulge. Verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Now, can you imagine that? This person standing in the flesh, the father, God, the maker of the universe, Yahweh, he shows me all that he does. I mean, they're, 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 their mouths are kind of open. They're looking at one another. Who does this guy think he is? Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. So he says that the father and the son have mutual love for one another. They share knowledge. The father's all-knowing. I'm all-knowing. Verse 21, for just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he pleases to give it. I mean, now this is outrageous. I mean, that little phrase, you might circle it, just as, they would have no problem. The Father raises the dead. Only God can raise the dead, right? Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And he says, yeah, the Son, I have that same power. Verse 22, moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. I mean, a Jew would go to 1 Samuel 2, 6, or Deuteronomy 32, 39. It would be, only God can judge. Only God could judge. I mean, he's saying, I mean, get this. The Father and I are one. We have the same power. He's all-knowing. I'm all-knowing. I see everything he does. In fact, the Father doesn't judge. He's given me to judge. And then the last one is sort of over the top. Why does he judge that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father? He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So he says he's dependent He has mutual love. They're both all-knowing. They have equal power. He's the judge, and he should receive the same honor as God. You need to understand, Jesus is bringing people to a crossroads. There's only two options. You either believe and bow before him based on these miracles that he's doing, or you realize that we got to get rid of him and kill him and reject him. And it's interesting. I would just pause today. Uh, I've been in a number of meetings lately with leaders of all kind of backgrounds of Christianity. And it's, it's really interesting that people are fine with Jesus being a teacher. People are fine with Jesus having good moral influence. Uh, people are fine with Jesus can, um, you know, help shape the culture to make it better for everyone. But what I want you to know is that's not the Jesus of the New Testament. The Jesus of the New Testament says... I'm the judge, I'm God, I'm unique, I verify it by miracles, I'm the only way to the Father, I've come from heaven, I see what the Father does, we have the same power, we should receive the same honor, I am 
the second person of the Trinity, and I am worthy to be worshipped, and I'm going to demonstrate to you why. And I will tell you, you can say God in public, but it's really interesting when you begin to talk about Jesus and the uniqueness of Jesus and, and the, the level of animosity that that produces then and now. I mean, I've always wondered, how come people, I mean, think of different religions. I've never heard people cuss with other religions. I mean, have you ever thought about that? I mean, I mean it's really interesting that there's something about the name of Jesus that, I mean, it, it divides. It's powerful. It's clear. And he's bringing it to a head with the people that have been trusted with the truth that should be the people leading others to the Father. And instead, they become blind guides. The second thing he does is not simply his relationship to the Father. Now he's going to explain his relationship to the world. And in uh, verses 24 through 26, he's going to declare that he's the Savior. He's going to just come out and say it. He's the Savior of the world. You're going to see in verse 24 the absolute clearest explanation of how a person receives eternal life from Jesus and can know you have it of anywhere in the Bible. Verse 24. Now, I mean, their, their jaws are dropping. The hair is on the back of their head. They're angry. And now he says, I tell you the truth. Or some of your old translations, verily, verily, I say unto you. Or truly, truly. It's a way of emphasis. It's underlined in bold. Listen up. Whoever hears my word and believes on him who sent me has eternal life. We just circle has, it's present tense. Has, not someday, some way, somehow. If you believe on me after hearing the truth, he says you has eternal life and will not come into condemnation. He has crossed over death from life. And then he goes on to say, I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And so he's just declaring, I'm the Savior of the world. This is how you have eternal life. It's not by studying scriptures. It's not by just knowing the Torah. It's not by being a good moral person. It's not by all your religious activity. Here's how you can have eternal life. And I put a picture up here. I diagrammed it. In fact, English teachers... You know how you diagram sentences, right? Subject, verb, direct object, and then you put all the lines. This diagrams really well. The first picture on the diagram is just um, up on your screen. It's very simply is that man, every man, every woman, when you hear the truth, when you hear Jesus, when you hear the gospel, when you hear the good news, and you believe, here's what happens you receive eternal life. On the left side under man, notice there's three things that are true of all of us. One, we have physical life. We're born with physical life. Number two, we all die. And number three, after we all die, we're all judged. The scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. You can go all around the world, any kind of religion, and I will tell you, there's some judgment somewhere. Even if it's, you know, some sort of plan where you come back as someone else, depending on how you did. After you die, intrinsic in mankind is there is a judgment. There has to be for justice and equity. And the Bible clearly teaches that you have a physical life. Everyone that has a physical life will die. And after everyone dies, we will be judged. This verse now teaches, look at on the right side. Those who hear and believe receive right now eternal life. They cross over from death to life, and there's no judgment. There's no judgment. You don't come into condemnation is the word. Can I just ask you, just for you personally, have you ever crossed over from death to life? I'm not asking if you're a nice person. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm not even asking if you intellectually believe in God. I'm asking on a certain day, at a certain time, have you ever heard? Now, I know you've heard because you're in this room right now. You're hearing the truth of the gospel and Jesus' claim. It happens to be coming through my voice, but I'm just reading what he said. If you have believed, 
And by believe isn't mental assent, it's entrusting, believing to the point of acting and trusting to follow. Then you have eternal life. You cross over from death to life. And the promise is there's no condemnation. You won't be judged because your sin and my sin, for those of us that have trusted Christ, have been placed on him as our substitute. And we have been forgiven. And we have received the life of Christ. And he received, when he died on the cross, the penalty for our sin. Does that make sense? So I have no idea kind of where you're at with your life. But I would just tell you, I would just shut me off. I mean, I'm going to keep talking. (laughs) But I would not even listen to me anymore if you are not 100% sure that you have eternal life right now. And I would pray quietly in my seat to God. And I would confess my sin, tell him I'm sorry, ask him to forgive me, and ask the Spirit of God to come into my life and make me a new person. And what I will tell you is he promises to do it. He's the Savior of the world. And you matter to him. I want to stop here right now, just like I did in the room when I taught this at church. And I want to ask you, have you ever prayed to receive Christ? Have you ever confessed your sin to God, admitted that you needed him, asked him to forgive you, acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord, that he's forgiven you, and you've asked him to be your savior? If you never have, this is going to be the greatest day of your life because God has this appointment between you and me right now. He cares for you. He loves you. And I want to give you an opportunity right now to... Simply pray an honest prayer, Lord Jesus, today I recognize that I fall short. I've done things wrong, what the Bible calls sin. And today I tell you I'm sorry. And I ask you at this very moment to forgive me and to cleanse me based solely on what Jesus did in my place. Thank you for dying to pay for my sin. Thank you for rising from the dead to prove that it's true. I ask you now, come into my life. Make me your son. Make me your daughter. Amen. You know, Jesus was very clear. As many as call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He said that if you receive me, you receive eternal life. So let me encourage you. Go to livingontheedge.tv. That's livingontheedge.tv. And we have some free resources to help you on your journey. You see, praying to receive Christ is like being born, born spiritually. Now I want to encourage you to grow in your new relationship with God. If you just prayed with Chip, I hope you'll take a moment and call us at 1-833-728-3788. We'd love to talk with you and get some free resources in your hands, specifically chosen to help you get started on your new journey of faith. Or if you prefer, you can go to our website, livingontheedge.tv, and click on New Believers at the bottom of the page to download those same resources called Starting Out Right. Best of all, it's available absolutely free. We just want to say welcome to the family. 